These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. And Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes, and in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh, and unto all his servants, and unto all his land. The great temptation which thine eyes have seen, the signs, and those great miracles. Yet the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. And I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. Ye have not eaten bread, neither have ye drunk wine or strong drink, and ye, that ye might know that I am the Lord your God. And when ye came unto this place, Sion the king of Heshbon and Og the king of Bashan came out against us unto battle, and we smote them. And we took their land and gave it for an inheritance unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, that ye may prosper in all that ye do. Ye stand this day, all of you before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders and your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and thy stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood unto the drawer of thy water, that thou shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God, as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob." Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. For ye know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which ye passed by, and ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them lest there should be among you a man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God and go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. And it come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him, but the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law so that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord hath laid upon it and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning that it is not sown nor beareth nor any grass groweth therein like the overthrow of, the, of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. Even all nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done thus unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? Then men shall say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served their gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Let me pray quickly. Heavenly Father, 
I thank you for your presence here today. And I pray, God, you would indeed walk us through these scriptures, let of your spirit, that we could hear what you want us to hear. Lord, do your will today. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So here in Deuteronomy 29, again, the covenant is being reiterated. He says in verse 1 very clearly, These are the words of the covenant, which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. So that first time in the wilderness, they spent much time in Horeb. That was the beginning of their journeys. Of course, they disobeyed that covenant, fell into apathy as far as walking with God. And as a result, 40 years they've wandered in the wilderness to find themselves predominantly in the land of Moab, now hearing this same covenant again. And that covenant is, if ye will, I will. God gives it to the people and he says, if ye certainly will obey my voice, I certainly will bless you. If you choose not to obey my voice, then curses will fall upon you. And this is how this covenant was portrayed and, and offered unto the people at this time. Here it's reiterated, it's renewed, it's refreshed to them. He says essentially, I will be your God, ye shall be my people if ye choose to do whatsoever I have commanded you. He wants that relationship, but men often choose to rebel and to turn from that relationship. Here they're in Moab, they're gathered together and they're about to cross over. And Moses in the book of Deuteronomy has been retelling the law that they heard many years ago. In verse 2 it says, Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them. So he gathers all the people together and he says this, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh and unto all his servants and unto all his land. In reality, physically speaking, only those aged about 50 to 60 would have recalled what he's talking about here, right? Because those that were of 20 years old and under, now I'll read it in Numbers chapter 32 and verse 11, he said, surely none of the men that came up from Egypt, and here he's talking to those that basically for fear of the enemy that was uh, in front of them, had received the witness, that, that, that poor witness of the land, received doubt as a result of, of that, did not fear God, feared men, and therefore now they could not enter in at that time. Surely none of those men that came up from Egypt, he says in Numbers 32, from 20 years old and upward shall see the land because they have not wholly followed me. So no one that was 20 years old and up is standing here at this time. So then we have from about 0 to 20 that are still living within that time frame, able to live and survive and, and make it to this day. And I just basically said that that would probably be from about age 50 to 60 because 10-year-olds may not have retained necessarily everything that happened here. Some of them perhaps. So, nevertheless, he says there in verse 2, ye have seen. Now we know very clearly that those under maybe 45 had not seen. Physically, they did not see, and if they saw, they've forgotten it long ago. So what is he talking about here? Well, go, if you would, keep your fingering there, and go to Galatians in chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 in your New Testament. Because this seems like a contradiction. He's telling people that surely have not seen this thing before their eyes in the land of Egypt, he's telling them that certainly they have seen it. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1, here's a prime example of what's going on here. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, watch this, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. He asked that question, why are you bewitched? You who have seen before your eyes evidence of Christ being crucified even among you. But the reality is, is that these people had not seen it. <laughs> these, these people that, that were saved much further after the, the, um, 
the gospel went forth into that land, perhaps. Much longer after the, the church was established there, Christ was crucified long ago, and nevertheless, he says, ye have seen evidence of this thing. What I believe he's talking to in regard to the Galatians is they were given a crystal clear gospel presentation. They were given crystal clear teachings and doctrine on the sufferings of Christ, and they had learned from the scriptures that were penned to this date all of these things, that being the evidence that was set forth. They, by faith and through those eyes of faith, saw Jesus Christ evidently crucified among them, and therefore that was the proof that the Apostle Paul here is referring to. If you turn to the right, we'll have another example. It's the eyes of faith that they're seeing through here. Though they did not see it, they heard the word of God, they received the word of God, and accepted it by faith, and that's how they're able to see what's being talked about here. In Colossians chapter 4, look with me in verse 3. It says, With all praying, also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. He wants here and he's desiring that God would open up utterance that the mystery of Christ could be clearly revealed to these people. Verse 4 it says, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Here he's praying that very clearly the gospel would go forth, the mystery of Christ would have free course and free passage to be uttered from him so that people could hear it manifestly. In other words, hear it very clearly and have understanding of these things. I'll read for you also, and you can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 29, John chapter 20 and verse 29. Jesus said to the multitudes that were gathered around them, or no, Jesus said actually to his disciples in particular here, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. They have not seen, and yet they believe all things that are being revealed to them. This is what Christ is talking about when he says, ye have seen it. The Apostle Paul says, ye have seen Christ evidently crucified among you. He's desiring that he could make this thing manifest, make it plain, make it so that people could see it clearly as it's being proclaimed from his mouth. And Jesus says that those that see through the eyes of faith, though they have not seen in person, blessed are they. And he was given a little bit of instruction to Thomas there who, who doubted until he could see physically. And he said, yet there's so many around us that have not seen physically and yet have believed. Blessed are they. Amen. So there in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 3, he talks about this, the great temptations which thine eyes have seen, the signs and those great miracles. So these are all alluding back to what was physically happened to a certain and small remnant that was here today, but was not clearly seen, though he's portraying to them that you have seen this. How did he see it? Well, look through Deuteronomy. He's constantly telling them to tell it to their children, to their children, and to their children, that they could believe, that they could do what's being taught here. While they have not seen it physically, it's being manifest, and here through the eyes of faith is essentially the same thing. Despite all these things that are witnessed, we have in verse 4, though, the, the, the uh, basically put down of the whole scenario. Ye have seen these things. They happen before your eyes. That remnant knows these things. And they were told that they had to tell them to the generations to come. Those temptations, the signs, and the great miracles. And G Jesus, or sorry, God here through the word of God says in verse 4, Yet the Lord hath not given you an heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. Now, they've seen all of these things, and yet they're not perceiving them. They've seen all these things, and yet they're really not seeing, they're really not hearing. Why is that the case? I don't believe that that's God withholding things from them, though it says, The Lord hath not given you these things. What's the part of the gift that most people out at the door refuse to take part in? The gift's there. It's present. It's, it's a, you're able to have it. It's free to whoever wants it. What do they have to do? They have to receive it. And this is what we constantly are encouraging people. These people, Israel, have not received what God has clearly given. Therefore, he says, the Lord hath not given you that heart to perceive. He hath not given you those eyes to see. He's not given you those ears to hear. Why? Because you did not want to receive it. And this is what he's telling the people here at this time. We continue on and we see more of the things that were done before them in person and they saw them. And they're also 
revealed and manifest to them through the preaching and through the teaching of those that did physically see these things. Miracles like, verse 5, And I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and your shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. Ye have not eaten bread, neither have ye drunk wine or strong drink, yet that ye might know that I am the Lord your God. And so he kept them pure, and he kept them separated. He also kept them clothed. We know that shoes wear out. We know that clothes wax old and never let God, less God did that miracle. Verse 7, it says, And when you came unto this place, Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us to battle, and we smote them. The Bible refers to those kings as kings that were greater and mightier than the people of Israel. And nevertheless, they were smitten by the people of Israel. Verse 8, it says, And we took their land and gave it for an inheritance, Unto the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and to half the tribe of Manasseh. Verse 9. Keep therefore the words of this covenant, and do them that ye may prosper in all that ye do. And if ye do, God will certainly uphold his part. And yet the people, for all that they've seen, and we've seen it happen time and time again, throughout the teaching in Deuteronomy, even as he refers back to the books previous, the people received of the miracle for a bit, but ultimately fell into unbelief and doubted God and turned from following after him. And eventually the cycle just begins. It's like the people get punished, the people get, get judged, and, and they hit this low and then they repent and then they seek after God. And they're on this spiritual high and things are going great and then they're comfortable and they're just going to fall back into the same cycle of, of um, essentially how all of us behave. So here, those that had not seen were told that they certainly have seen these things. They are manifest before them. And so there's no reason through the preaching of the word, there's no reason through what they had actually seen with their eyes that they should be rejecting God Almighty. He basically set them up for success, showing them all that he would do and could do, basically giving them a sneak peek of the promised land as he carried them through this wilderness. Verse 10, it continues and says, Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders and your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and thy stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood unto the drawer of the water. He says here that they are standing together, all of them. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 10 shows that it is not only your leadership, not only all the men, but verse 11 says your little ones as well, your wives, even strangers, people that work for you. They're all gathered here today, standing before this covenant about to receive it. There's a unity here. And I like that because everybody here is going to have to be in agreement to what's about to take place. Romans chapter 15 and verse 6 says, With one mind and with one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's one mind there. There's, there's a unity in glorifying God that God wants to see. He wants His people to be united in that front, in that way. The same is true in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. It says, Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. Philippians 2 and verse 2 says, Be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And Psalm chapter 133 brings it all together and says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And so united they all come and they stand before God Almighty God. They stand before Moses as the law is given and as, as the last few instructions are given before they're going to enter into that promise made so long ago. The few that have seen have told it to the generations after. So now everybody has seen and, and should understand and has every opportunity to believe and act upon what they have believed. Everyone is gathered together, so no one is going to be able to say, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this covenant. I don't know this God. No, they're all brought together for the express purpose that they are showing unity towards hearing what is next. But the problem was they were not united in the Spirit necessarily. They were there. They were present. 
But God very clearly indicates that they had not received a heart to perceive, eyes to see, and ears to hear. Some had. I believe, I believe a good portion of them had received and understood and were, were honest in their reception of each one of those things. But there are certainly some that have a different spirit, are not united in this same fashion. Nevertheless, this is what God desires. Unity when people gather together. Unity in glorifying God. Unity comes with comfort and, and peace to be dwelled in. He wants you to be like-minded, be of one accord, be of the same mind. United, and that's a good and pleasant thing for God's people to partake in. Unity. Verse 12, it says that thou shouldest enter into the covenant with the Lord thy God and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day. He wants them to all be united in entering into thy covenant. He wants everybody present, everybody attentive, ready to hear what he's going to put forward in that, that agreement that he wants them to agree to and to accept and to choose this day to follow. Verse 13, it says, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, that he may be unto thee a God as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He established here a people, a promised people. And that's what they were to be. They were promised. It was sworn unto them that they would be this people under him as God. And this is what God is seeking to establish. This is why he's gathered them all together to hear what's coming at to play next. They were also to be not only a promised people, but a fruitful people. Look at verse 14. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. Now they were to be a fruitful people. Meaning, not only were those that were standing there this day to receive of the covenant, but look what he says in the second part of verse 15. He's making it also with him that is not here with us this day. So there are certainly those that are not present. They stayed home. They couldn't make it. Whatever took place, God intended for all to be there and united. What I mean by saying that they're fruitful is that even those that weren't there to hear the covenant, they were to hear it. They were to be told it later. Maybe those that come, come by a, in a different time and in a later date, they were to hear that same covenant. That's why God says, I'm not just making this covenant and this oath with you. I'm also making it to those who aren't even present. Those that one day will be present. And there's an interesting uh, phrase in Nehemiah that stood out to me, I think in the first chapter, where he says, he says um, look unto those that, that desire to fear thy name. People that don't even fear God, Nehemiah was praying, those that even desire to fear God, that will one day seek after and get a hold of that desire and fear God. He's looking forward to those that will be saved and brought into that same covenant as a result to the, of the ministry of the people of God at this time. We've got to remember that Israel, though we don't have those famous soul-winning verses to attach to them, like we have at the end of Matthew and other places, Israel were to be a soul-winning nation. They were to be a light to lighten the Gentiles. They were to be salt and light in a dark world. And their example and their preaching and teaching of the word and their explanations of the scriptures, their even having the oracles of God was there so that they could bring many to the same faith that they held. Now, just like often we don't do, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. And therefore, kind of generation after generation after generation, things just got worse and worse and worse. But we're not here to pick on Israel because, look, we are the same way, aren't we? We tend to fall into the same trip, tricks and the same traps of, of our own flesh and of, of the world around us and therefore get, get apathetic with respect to actually getting the gospel out there and seeking the lost and teaching our generations after us and, and showing people the light that is in our wonderful Savior. And that's what Israel did in the same way. But they are to be fruitful because God here says, I made the covenant with them which are not even here this day. Those people that haven't even heard it yet. Verse 16 talks about how this might happen. It says, For ye know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt, 
and how we came through the nations which he passed by. They came through and passed by many nations. They dwelt in the land of Egypt as a physically separated people, but also just a very different people, didn't they? They were, they were so different that, is, that Egypt actually chose to put them in the land of Goshen, separating them chiefly from their own people because they, they, were, uh, they, they were people that kept sheep. They were shepherds, and the, the Egyptians found that was abominable. So they were different. They lived differently. They acted differently. They followed a different God. And this is exactly what shows them to be God's specific and chosen people at this time. You know how we dwelt in the land of Egypt, separate and different. We came through the nations and passed through them as a separate and distinct and different people. In verse 17 it says, And ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. The people of Israel lived differently, and they also saw the ways of the heathen, the unbelievers. Now, in Deuteronomy 18, in verse 9, it says, Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of these nations. If God completely separated them and removed them from the world that they were to be reached, there would be, there would be no chance that the light would get to them. But God also wanted the strict warning that while you are in this world, you're not of this world. And, and while you see what this world does, you're not to follow after it. You're not to learn from it. God's not prescribing some sort of separation that's completely removed. Let's go live as cloistered monks and not have the world get anything on us or touch us at all. He's not advocating for that at all because he says here that the way that his word would go forth is that you're dwelling in the land of Egypt, though slightly separated from them. And now he's saying you're passing through these nations as strangers and pilgrims and foreigners that they can see you and you can see them. And as a result, perhaps you could be an influence on them. And even one person that receives the covenant as a result of seeing that means the whole world into God. And that was his intent from the beginning. In verse 31 of chapter 13, he says, Learn to fear the Lord your God. So he doesn't want them to learn after the abominations of these nations. Here he says, essentially, be an influence unto these nations while learning to fear the Lord your God. And that's essentially the entirety of Deuteronomy in a nutshell as far as evangelism goes and reaching the world around you. Be an example of the believers is even our ministry today. We're to be examples of what a believer on Jesus Christ looks like to the world, showing them what a Christian does, how they behave, how they talk, how they walk, how they serve their God at the same while. Don't let the world get on you. Learn not their ways. Show the way while learning not the ways of the heathen. Certainly there's always a danger in seeing these things and learning after them. Otherwise, God wouldn't be warning his people about that. Verse 18 says, Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God and go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. And it come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse and he bleth himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of mine heart to add drunkenness to thirst. He's warning them about that haughty statement, I shall have peace. I shall have peace as a result of my being God's chosen people. I shall have peace as a result of my prestige and my placement in this world. Peace comes from being of one accord and of one mind, and that mind has to be the mind of Christ. That's what we've already saw explained in the passages that we went to in the New Testament. Our great peace comes from being of one accord and of one mind and being lockstep with the mind of God. He is the Prince of Peace, and that's what we need to be grabbing a hold of. But there certainly is punishment in seeing and learning the ways of the world, and there certainly is danger of seeing these things. And God doesn't want, though we're to be in the world, us to be affected by the world, lest we get caught up, turn away from God, go and serve the gods of these nations, bring forth gall and wormwood and the disgusting things, and ultimately end up with pride having all these curses upon us. And when we're cursed, we look at it as if it's some blessing from God. And it's just a strange mentality. These people have gotten all twisted up to the end that their thirst is now has drunkenness added to it. So they're just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And that's the logical and scriptural end to those that turn from God in the first place. Remember Lot's wife. 
She got too far in the world, didn't she? she? They were to be salt and light. And if Lot was there, I've done the math. If even they just reached one person, they would have gotten to the ten that would have saved that whole city. But they reached nobody. And so Lot, if he would have had his daughters marry um, men that believed on Jesus, and, and then, and then that, that family, that, that core of Lot's family, would have been the ten sufficient to do it, but it wasn't the case for them. They just assimilated into the world. I think the first time the world ever heard, the world of Sodom ever heard of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was that moment when Lot first came into his sons-in-laws and, and told them of it, the judgment to come, and they looked at him as some sort of mocker. What are you even talking about, old man? I've never even heard of this God. Why are you ranting and raving about these things all of a sudden? It was because it was too late. The effect had taken place. They'd become assimilated into the world, and then the end result was destruction. Lot's wife in particular loved that world so much that she had to be pulled out by an angel by the hand, and when she got pulled out, she was just on the crest of, of, the, of the hill. One opportunity left to just step over and into God's world, I think, and she decided instead to turn and look back and take one last look at the world she loved, and she became a pillar of salt. Salt that hath lost its savor, good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of man, I think. Remember Lot's wife and that hard lesson that comes from getting too close to the world that we're supposed to reach. Yes, we have to get it close to the world. We might get a little bit of dirt on us when we're next to unclean and dirty things, for sure. But, ultimately, we have to keep our hearts and our minds and our life separated from them so that we can be a light and an example unto the lost and dying world. Continuing on in verse 20, and it says, The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him and the Lord shall blot out of his name from under heaven. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. So that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord God hath laid upon it and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning that it was not that it is not sown nor beareth nor any grass groweth thereon, like unto the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. The Lord here says that when that comes upon God's people, corporately or individually, he will not spare his anger. He will not spare his jealousy and his, his curses. He'll separate his people unto evil. In other words, take them and put them in a particular place where there is just hurt and harm coming upon them. This is often manifested in ways like plagues and sickness and, and devastation to the land that they're dwelling in and ultimately ruin. This is an example, and Sodom and Gomorrah is often brought up, an ex example to them that afterwards should live ungodly. The end of that is overthrow. The end of that is wrath from God. And none of us want to be partakers of that. So, remain separate. Spiritually, remain separate best you can physically while still being salt and light unto this ungodly world. We can do it. It's possible because that's what God expects. You have to get out there and in the world to be an evangelist unto the world and to reach them. So ultimately, this is the witness that God gives forth. If he can't show how wonderful he is by blessing his people, by, by showing the world how great he is in caring for his people because his people refuse to obey him, if he can't bless his people because ultimately they refuse to do according to his will, remember the covenant is, if ye shall, I will, so if people, mankind refuses, especially God's people, refuse to uphold his commandments and he can't bless them, because that's his desire. He wanted the whole world to look upon God's people and say, wow, 
They have these great laws. They have this great God. They're blessed. They're cared for. They have everything because of how wonderful their God is. Let me get a piece of that. Let me get in on, on, on what God has to offer. That was the witness that God wanted in this world. We follow after him and he blesses us richly beyond compare so that the whole world comes to see what God has provided and wants some of it. But ultimately, if he can't get glory out of blessing his people in that way because of our mistakes and our faults and our sins, he will judge his people harshly to the same end. That people look and say, wow. Look what their God did to them because they refused, they rejected, they turned from serving after him. I need to get right with this God because of the wrath that he puts upon his own people. And we know that judgment, especially in these last days, must begin the house of God. And certainly if it first begin with us, what shall be the end of those which believe not? It'll be harsh, it'll be hard, but I think it'll be a little bit later and a little bit delayed. In the last days, unfortunately, judgment's going to happen on those that profess to be God's people. Why? Because God is trying to get glory from them. Now, that doesn't mean that all people that are calling themselves Christians need to be brought to ruin, need to be judged harshly, need to face plagues and sickness and devastation. No, no, no. But corporately and the majority of those that profess to be Christians, I believe, will face that. Now, we can still, as individuals, have our Goshen. How do we do that? We, as an individual, leading our family and those that are around us, we, as a church, can decide to obey God, to follow His lead, and to seek after Him and be saved from these things. We can still have that testimony among the world that, wow, look how amazingly God has blessed this man, this family, as a result of them following him. How do I get some of that? What must I do to be saved? Certainly we can have that, but we have to make that decision individually and consciously to follow after God. I believe in the last days, judgment will begin at the house of God. And as the smoke of the judgment of God's people, those that are confessing and professing to be followers of Christ, as the judgment falls upon them, it's to the end that God would receive glory. They would repent and turn back unto him. And the world would look at that scenario and say, wow, this is, a, this is a terrible God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And if it were possible, some might even get saved to the glory of God the Father in that day. Last days people, last days God's people are a spiritual wreck. And we can see that everywhere we look. Churches are falling into apostasy. Churches are closing up their doors and refusing to assemble. Churches are seeking after everything but the kingdom of God, it seems. They're trying to figure out sometimes just how to pay their bills and how to pay for their big old building that they have. Everybody's refusing to show up to the assembly, even if it is open. They don't even tune in. I was just watching this morning that church that I know has well over two, 300 people in attendance in the auditorium had like 15 watching from home and the auditorium closed off. That's not what God envisioned in the last days. That's not what God commands and wants from his people in the last days. He wants us to do more. He wants us to have more excitement, more fervency, more desire after him. And when we do that individually, then God has no choice per this covenant, right? No choice but to bless us. It's not like God is going to see us getting after him, obeying his commandments, following after him, and then he's going to still have us fall into the same judgment as those that are rejecting him. No, no, no. God's covenant is, if ye will obey my word, if ye will seek after me, if ye will follow my commandments and keep your end of the covenant, then I will. God promises that he will bless richly. And we read about those. Those blessings are amazing. Imagine the world in famine and your storehouse is busting out at the seams. That's the promise of God to those that will obey him. God cannot, will not, has never reneged on his covenant. This still stands. To those that will obey him, they shall be blessed. We have that added and wonderful benefit that we're in Christ, we're born again. We have the earnest of the Holy Spirit illuminating the scriptures to us, showing us how we can more, better, and, and closer follow after this word of God. But ultimately, the same is true. Obey God. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And that promise still stands. Look and see at the world around you, and you see that Christians are spiritually dead, and they're looking more and more like the world around them. They heard the words, 
Now they're receiving the curse as a result of rejecting those words. And yet so many are saying, I shall have peace. Not realizing they're just walking in their own imaginations, their foolish hearts, adding drunkenness to their thirst. They're not understanding that God is against them at this time. Simply because they chose not to obey him. Verse 24, it says, Even all the nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done thus unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? And this is what I'm saying, that ultimately the truth will go forward. The people have looked upon the judgment. The nations are looking on the judgment. And they're saying, why did God do such a thing? And God is using even the judgment of his own people to get glory unto himself and to have that testimony go forward of himself, that he is great and wonderful and powerful and almighty and he's the savior of all and needs to be sought after. The truth will go forward, whether we want to be the purveyors of it or not, whether we want to open our mouths or not, God will use us as an example, whether positive or negative, to get glory unto himself. Now, I desire to be a positive example. Have God bless me. Have God, have God show himself strong and mighty through carrying me through hard times and having me lift up above others that are around me that are not following after him. That's my desire. That's what would be certainly best. Blessings upon blessings upon blessings. But that comes with the cost of obedience upon obedience upon obedience. The reality is, is God's way is always right and God's way is always perfect. So it's better to just follow that anyways. Verse 25, it talks about men. The nations have said, why did God do this thing? What's the heat of the, this great anger? Verse 25, then men shall say. Now this is because they, okay? So nations are asking why God's people are in such a sorry state. What's the reason for the fierceness of his anger? And now the unbelieving world that live in this nation are responding correctly. They have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. And the Lord and the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. What an amazing thing that the world even knows the, the reason for Israel's great fall that God is here promising. Why? Because he ensured that the testimony would go up proper. And look what the testimony is. That the anger of God is kindled when his people choose to rebel against him. His wrath and indignation falls when people decide to seek after their own gods, their own imaginations, follow after their own ways. That's when God gets the most hot and the most heated and throws down his wrath upon any people. But here God is using his own people. Judgment must begin at the house of God. He's using his own people to be example to the unbelieving nations, unbelieving world. Would to God it would be a good testimony that there would just be this famine and ruin and rots going on everywhere except for this nation and these people that chose to follow God. But it's just not the case. And in the last days, I believe it just will not be the case that there's going to be a spiritual revival of true Christianity. Rather, they're going to remove further and further and further away. And that first judgment will be hot against God's people and those that would name the name of Christ and those that would say they are born again, blood-bought, redeemed by the Son of God. They're going to face wrath, and it could just be that it's there so that men would look upon them and say, wow, that's what it's like to forsake the God of heaven. That's what it's like to turn from the true God, though you've named him so many times. That's what happens when God's people forsake his right and good way, and perhaps, peradventure, they will repent. Look, God's going to use blessings or curses to get people into his will. It's the goodness of God that leadeth to repentance. And, and, and right or wrong, how we perceive it, God's ultimately leading everybody in that direction. Now look at verse 29. This wraps it up nicely. It says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. And that's why God was able to confidently affirm through Moses that ye have seen what happened in Egypt. 
Why? Because of the things that are revealed. He was able to say to a people that weren't even born at the time of these events, ye have seen all that I have done. My, um, my anger, my, my wrath, my miracles, my signs, my wonders. You've seen it. Why? Because it's been plainly revealed unto you. Regarding secret things, these are the things that we often destroy our Christian walk and our Christian testimony about and even break off in fellowship sometimes. Secret things. Think about it. The Godhead. Think about it. Details, finer points about heaven and hell. Think about it. A secret thing. The power of his resurrection. Remember the Apostle Paul was saying, Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He had a bunch of holes in his understanding, admittedly so. There are secret things in the scripture which God here is clearly indicating. They belong to me. But the things that are revealed the things that are plainly understood in scriptures, the things that I don't need to go and apply my logic, my reasoning, my what I have seen or experienced to it, those things that are revealed, they belong unto us. And God has it so. He purposely gave and revealed those things to us. Why? That we and our children forever and forever and forever and forever may do the words of this law. He revealed them to us very plainly. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't hide or conceal these things. He didn't misconstrue. Look, he just laid out the same law twice. And if you read them one for one, back and forth, there is no contradiction. There is no confusion. They are perfectly clear what God expects from his people. And his covenant is also an equally clear. If you do these things, I have no choice but to bless you in these. He revealed them to us that we may do them. He made them plain unto us that we may do them. And that ought to be the focus of our daily walk with Christ. The secret things are there to, to illuminate your mind, to tickle your fancy, to encourage you to study more. Absolutely, it's good to try to grasp the Godhead deeper. It's good to try to grasp topics of heaven and hell. And those, those, those minor, do I'm not going to say they're minor doctrines, but they're, they're doctrines that have less of a, of a line of testimony in scripture. So they're, they're easy to be misunderstood because we just don't have a body of evidence to pick from. Those items are there for their intended purpose to make us seek after God and desire to know more of him. But look at the apostle Paul. He's still at the end of his life desired to know more of these types of things. But these things that are revealed are revealed in such a way, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not honor thy father. They're plain and they're clear and they're available for understanding to whoever will receive them. Men, women, child, little ones, strangers, hewers of wood, bringers of water. Everybody has the ability to receive what God's giving. An understanding heart to perceive, eyes to see, and ears to hear with respect to these items. You simply have to go there with an open heart, ready to receive them and desire to receive them and say, God, show me these things and he certainly will reveal them unto you. We have an obsession today about some secret thing. This whole Q a nonsense movement is based upon knowing some secret thing. Do you know that Trump had to lose the election so that he could enact some sort of secret government law that, for, that he had to give it over to the communists so that then he could use that opportunity to take back the government. And he's just waiting to throw like Hillary into prison. And he's got this all set up. This, there's a whole movement of people that are truthers of sort, but it's all just based on nonsense and, sh and, and, and crazy uh, prophecies that over and over and over and over haven't come to pass. They ought to be rejected, this whole Q and nonsense movement. But people seek after it. Why? Because everyone wants to know some secret thing. Everyone wants to know some new thing. And Christians are falling for the same trap. Throw away the secret things. Okay? Talking about what the world's giving you. Leave aside the secret things that God has in his scripture. A little bit of a mystery. Hard to understand. Leave those aside for now because you've got enough on your plate with what's revealed to you to keep you busy for the rest of your days. Find a command in the Bible and pray about it and say, God, am I doing this with the fullness of my heart? Am I succeeding in this area of my life with all my mind, will, and emotion? Am I fully given unto that? And watch him reveal, no, you've fallen short in this way and on that day and in this moment. And when you do this, 
and then just get after a command that is revealed plainly unto us and try to keep that with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, all the while loving God, loving your neighbor. That's the true walk, and that's the thing that we need to be focused most on. And that's the purpose, I believe, of God calling all these people in unity to agree to, buy into, get on board with this covenant, is because he wants to reveal things to them that will help them to do all the words of the law. And when they receive of what's being revealed, them, their children, the generations to come will all be blessed as a result. A wonderful gift from God. Understanding, wonderful gift from God when we receive understanding and do what it is saying is the blessings that he must outpour, outpour unto us. He'll give us blessings. He'll give us encouragement. He'll give us strength. Too many of us want to strain out a gnat and swallow a camel with some of these secret things. Too many of us want to omit the weightier matters of the law, which I'm telling you is what's plainly revealed. That's the weightier matter in this in this uh, time frame. It's the plain scriptures that we need to trust and obey. We want to omit those weightier matters to go and swallow a camel. We want to omit those weightier matters and go and find some finer point about the tithes and the offerings so that we can make ourselves feel real smart. We want to omit weightier matters of just living a godly, decent, Christian life because we want to have some new thing to reveal to somebody and hold them accountable to about the Godhead, about heaven and hell, about the power of his resurrection. We just want to puff ourselves up and eventually we'll just become like those in verse 10. Heareth the words of this curse and bless themselves in it. Oh, I'm being cursed because God just loves me so much. Because he says, I walk in the imagination of my own heart. In other words, I think I got it figured out. I've got some strange imagination of, of this, that, and the other. And I'm going to use that as a battering ram against my brother. Instead of just focusing on what's plainly revealed. And this is what we as individuals need to do. Especially in these last days. Not only is it a blessing to be removed and in Goshen so that when the judgment falls upon this world, we have our own separate space. That's kind of like this church. That's kind of like our families. It's our Goshen. But above and beyond that even, we want to be separated even in walking in Goshen. Able to reach the world. Able to see the world. Ever, able to be a light to the world so they can look and see all these curses are falling upon us, but those blessed believers of God are being lifted up by Him. We want them to be able to see them. We want to be able to show them that testimony. But we have to do it smartly. We have to do it while remaining separate. Be an example, but don't let the world hinder you in your walk. Trust and obey. Ask God to show you these personal revelations of what is plain in the scriptures and walk in it. Take one command this day and try to walk in it. And you'll do so much more in the Christian life, into the glory of God the Father, than some theologian that pulled some nugget out of an obscure book and then tries to go tell everybody how smart he is because he's got that thing figured out. That's a secret thing. That belongs unto God. God will share it with you, I'm sure, but that's not the most important thing. Those things that are revealed will benefit you. They'll benefit your children forever. And when you know the words of the law and do the words of the law, Therein lies the blessing of God, and you can avoid curses from him altogether. He promised. He can't break that promise. If you do, he will do. If you follow and seek after, draw nigh unto God, he will draw nigh unto you. And show himself to be the strong father that he is in your life. And that will be an example to the world around you. You can be salt and you can be light. It starts with obedience unto God, Almighty God. Amen. Thank you for